The Good Oak by Aldo Leopold There are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is the danger of supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery, and the other that heat comes from the furnace. To avoid the first danger, one should plant a garden, preferably where there is no grocer to confuse the issue. To avoid the second, he should lay a split of good oak on the andirons, preferably where there is no furnace, and let it warm his shins while February's blizzard tosses the trees outside. If one has cut, split, hauled, and piled his own good oak, and let his mind work the while, he will remember much about where the heat comes from. And with a wealth of detail denied to those who spend the weekend in town astride a radiator. The particular oak now aglow on my andirons grew on the bank of the old immigrant road where it climbs the sand hill. The stump, which I measured upon felling the tree, has a diameter of 30 inches. It shows 80 growth rings, hence the seedling from which it originated must have laid its first ring of wood in 1865, at the end of the Civil War. But I know from the history of present seedlings that no oak grows above the reach of rabbits without a decade or more of getting girdled each winter and respouting during the following summer. Indeed, it is all too clear that every surviving oak is the product of either rabbit negligence or rabbit scarcity. Someday, some patient botanist will draw a frequency curve of oak birth years and show the curve humps every 10 years, each hump originating from a low in the 10-year rabbit cycle, a fauna and flora, by this very process of perpetual battle within and among species achieve collective immortality. It is likely, then, that a low in rabbits occurred in the middle of the 60s, when my oak began to lay on annual rings, but that the acorn that produced it fell during the preceding decade, when the covered wagons were still passing over my road into the great northwest. It may have been the wash and wear of emigrant traffic that bared this road bank, and thus enabled this particular acorn to spread its first leaves to the sun. Only one acorn in a thousand ever grew large enough to fight rabbits. The rest were drowned at birth in the prairie sea. It is a warning thought that this one wasn't, and thus lived to garner 80 years of June sun. It is this sunlight that is now being released through the intervention of my axe and saw to warm my shack and my spirit through 80 gusts of blizzard. And with each gust a wisp of smoke from my chimney bears witness, to whomsoever it may concern, that the sun did not shine in vain. My dog does not care where the heat comes from, but he cares ardently that it come, and soon. Indeed, he considers my ability to make it come as something magical. For when I rise in the cold black pre-dawn, and kneel shivering by the hurt, making a fire, he pushes himself blandly between me and the kindling splints I have laid on the ashes, and I must touch a match to them by poking it between his legs. Such faith, I suppose, is the kind that moves mountains. It was a bolt of lightning that put an end to the wood-making by this particular oak. We were all awakened, one night in July, by the thunder's crash. We realized that the bolt must have hit nearby, but, since it had not hit us, we all went back to sleep. Man brings all things to the test of himself, and this is notably true of lightning. Next morning, as we strolled over the sand hill, rejoicing with the cone flowers and the prairie clovers over their fresh ascension of rain, we came upon a great slab of bark freshly torn from the trunk of a roadside oak. The trunk showed a long spiral scar of barkless sapwood, a foot wide and not yellowed by the sun. By the next day the leaves had wilted, and we knew that the lightning had bequeathed to us three cords of prospective fuel wood. We mourned the loss of the old tree, but knew that a dozen of its progeny standing straight and stalwart on the sands had already taken over its job of wood making. 
We let the dead veteran season for a year in the sun it could no longer use. And then, on a crisp winter's day, we laid a newly filed saw into its bastion base. Fragrant little chips of history spewed from the saw cut and accumulated on the snow before each kneeling saw. We sensed that these two piles of sawdust were something more than wood, that they were the integrated transect of a century, that our saw was fighting its way, stroke by stroke, decade by decade, into the chronology of a lifetime, written in concentric annual rings of a good oak. It took only a dozen pulls of the saw to transect the few years of our ownership, during which we had learned to love and cherish this farm. Abruptly, we began to cut the years of our predecessor, the bootlecker, who hated this farm, skinned it of residual fertility, burned its farmhouse, threw it back into the lap of the county, with delinquent taxes to boot, and then disappeared among the landless anomalies of the Great Depression. Yet the oak had laid down good wood for him. His sawdust was as fragrant, as sound, and as pink as our own. An oak is no respecter of persons. The reign of the bootlegger ended sometime during the Dust Bowl droughts of 1936, 1934, 1933, and 1930. Oak smoke from its still and peat from burning marshlands must have clouded the sun in those years, and alphabetical conservation was abroad in the land, but the sawdust showed no change. Rest, cries the chief sar, and we pause for breath. Now our saw bites in the 1920s the Babidian decade when everything grew bigger and better in heedlessness and arrogance until 1929, when the stock markets crumbled. If the oak had heard them fall, its wood gives no signs, nor did it heed the legislature's several protestations of love for trees, a national forest and a forced crop law in 1927 a great refuge on the Upper Mississippi bottomlands in 1924, and a new forest policy in 1921. Neither did it notice the demise of the state's last Martin in 1925, nor the arrival of its first starling in 1923. In March 1922, the Big Sleet tore the neighboring elms limb from limb. But there is no sign of damage to our tree. What is a ton of ice, more or less, to a good oak? Rest, cries the chief saw, and we pause for breath. Now the saw bites into 1910-20, to 20, the decade of the drainage dream, when steam shovels sucked dry the marshes of central Wisconsin to make farms, and made ash heaps instead. Our marsh escaped, not because of any caution or forbearance among engineers, but because the river floods it each April, and did so with a vengeance, perhaps a defensive vengeance, in the years 1913-16. to 16. The oak laid on wood just the same, even in 1915, when the Supreme Court abolished the state forests, and Governor Philip pontificated that state forestry is not a good business proposition. It did not occur to the governor that there might be more than one definition of what is good, and even of what is business. It did not occur to him that while the courts were writing one definition of goodness in the law books, buyers were writing quite another one on the face of the land. Perhaps to be a governor, one must be free from doubt on such matters. While forestry receded during this decade, game conservation advanced. In 1916, pheasants became successfully established in Waukesha County. In 1915, federal law prohibited spring shooting. In 1913, a state game farm was started. In 1912, a buck law protected female deer. In 1911, an epidemic of refuges spread over the state. Refuge became a holy word, but the oak took no heed. Rest, cries the chief sar, and we pause for breath. Now we cut 1910, when a great university president published a book on conservation. 
A great sawfly epidemic killed millions of tamaracks. A great drought burned the pineries, and a great dredge drained Horicon Marsh. We cut 1909, when smelt were first planted in the Great Lakes, and when a wet summer induced the legislature to cut the forest fire appropriations. We cut 1908, a dry year when the forests burned fiercely, and Wisconsin parted with its last cougar. We cut 1907, when a wandering lynx looking in the wrong direction for the promised land ended his career among the farms of Dane County. We cut 1906, when the first state forester took office, and fires burned 17,000 acres in these sand counties. We cut 1905, when a great flight of goshawks came out of the north and ate up the local grouse. They no doubt perched in this tree to eat some of mine. We cut 1902 to 3, a winter of bitter cold, 1901, which brought the most intense drought on record, rainfall only 17 inches, 1900, a centennial year of hope, of prayer, and the usual annual ring of the oak. Rest, cries the chief saw, and we pause for breath. Now our saw bites into the 1890s, called gay by those whose eyes turn cityward rather than landward. We cut 1899, when the last passenger pigeon coiled with a charge of shot near Babak, two counties to the north. We cut 1898, when a dry fall followed by a snowless winter froze the soil seven feet deep and killed the apple trees. 1897, another drought year, when another forestry commission came into being. 1896, when 25,000 prairie chickens were shipped to market from the village of Spooner alone. 1895, another year of fires. 1894, another drought year. In 1893, the year of the bluebird storm, when a March blizzard reduced the migrating bluebirds to near zero. The first bluebirds always alighted in this oak, but in the middle 90s, it must have gone without. We cut 1892, another year of fires. 1891, a low in the grouse cycle. In 1890, the year of the Babcock milk tester, which enabled Governor Hale to boast, half a century later, that Wisconsin is America's dairy land. The motor licenses which now parade the boast were then not foreseen, even by Professor Babcock. It was likewise in 1890 that the largest pine rafts in history slipped down the Wisconsin River, in full view of my oak, to build an empire of red barns for the cows of the prairie states. Thus it is the good pine now that stands between the cow and the blizzard, just as a good oak stands between the blizzard and me. Rest, cries the chief saw, and we pause for breath. Now our saw bites into the 1880s, into 1889, a drought year in which Arbor Day was first proclaimed, into 1887, when Wisconsin appointed its first game wardens, into 1886, when the College of Agriculture held its first short course for farmers, into 1885, preceded by a winter of unprecedented length and severity, into 1883, when Dean W. H. Henry reported that the spring flowers at Madison bloomed 13 days later than average. Into 1882, the year Lake Menendota opened a month late following the historic Big Snow and bitter cold of 1881-82. to It was likewise in 1881 that the Wisconsin Agricultural Society debated the question how do you account for the second growth of black oak timber that has sprung up all over the country in the past 30 years? My oak was one of these. One debater claimed spontaneous generation. Another claimed regurgitation of acorns by southbound pigeons. Rest, cries the chief sawyer, and we pause for breath. Now our saw bites in the 1870s, the decade of Wisconsin's carousal in wheat. 
Monday morning came in 1879, when chinch bugs, grubs, rust, and soil exhaustion finally convinced Wisconsin farmers that they could not compete with the virgin prairies further west in the game of weeding land to death. I suspect that this farm played its share in the game, and that the sand below just north of my oak had its origin in overweeding. The same year of 1879 saw the first planting of carp in Wisconsin, and also the first arrival of quackgrass as a stowaway from Europe. On October 27, 1879, six migrating prairie chickens perched on the roof tree of the German Methodist Church in Madison and took a look at the growing city. On the 8th of November, the markets at Madison were reported to be flooded with ducks at 10 cents each. In 1878, a deer hunter from Sauk Rapids remarked prophetically, the hunters promised to outnumber the deer. On the 10th of September, 1877, two brothers shooting Muscogo Lake bagged 210 blue-winged teal in one day. In 1876 came the wettest year of record, a rainfall that piled up 50 inches. Prairie chickens declined, perhaps owing it to the hard rains. In 1875, four hunters killed 153 prairie chickens at York Prairie, one county to the eastward. In the same year, the U.S. Fish Commission planted Atlantic salmon in Devil's Lake. 10 miles south of my oak. In 1874, the first factory-made barbed wire was stapled to oak trees. I hope no such artifacts are buried in the oak now under saw. In 1873, one Chicago firm received and marketed 25,000 prairie chickens. The Chicago trade collectively bought 600,000 at $3.25 per dozen. In 1872, the last wild Wisconsin turkey was killed, two counties to the southeast. It is appropriate that the decade ending the pioneer carousal in wheat should likewise have ended the pioneer carousal in pigeon blood. In 1871, within a 50-mile triangle spreading northwestward from my oak, 136 million pigeons are estimated to have nested, and some may have nested in it for it was then a thrifty sapling of 20 feet tall. Pigeon hunters by scores piled their trade with net and gun. Club and salt lick and trainloads of prospective pigeon pie moved southward and eastward towards the cities. It was the last big nesting in Wisconsin, and nearly the last in any state. This same year, 1871, brought other evidence of the March of Empire. The Peshtigo Fire, which cleared a couple of counties of trees and soil, and the Chicago Fire, said to have started from the protesting kick of a cow. In 1870, the meadow mice had already staged their march of empire. They ate up the young orchards of the young state and then died. They did not eat my oak, whose bark was already too tough and thick for mice. It was likewise in 1870 that a market gunner boasted in the American Sportsman of killing 6,000 ducks in one season near Chicago. Rest, cries the chief sar, and we pause for breath. Our saw now cuts in the 1860s, when thousands died to settle the question, is the man-to-man -man community lightly to be dismembered? They settled it. But they did not see, nor did we yet see, that same question applies to the man-to-land community. This decade was not without its gropings toward the larger issue. In 1867 increase, A. Lefam induced the State Horticultural Society to offer prizes for forest plantations. In 1866, the last native Wisconsin elk was killed. The saw now severs 1865, the pith year of our oak. In that year, John Murr offered to buy from his brother, who then owned the home farm 30 miles east of my oak, 
a sanctuary for wildflowers that had gladdened his youth. His brother declined to part with the land, but he could not suppress the idea. 1865 still stands in Wisconsin history as the birth year of mercy for all things natural, wild, and free. We have cut the core. Our saw now reverses its orientation in history. We cut backward across the years and outward towards the far side of the stump. At last there's a tremor in the great trunk. The saw curve suddenly widens and the saw is quickly pulled away as the sawyers spring backwards to safety. All hands cry, Timber! My oak leans, groans, and crashes with earth-shaking thunder till I prostrate across the emigrant road that gave it birth. Now comes the job of making wood. The mall rings on steel wedges as the sections of the trunk are upended one by one, only to fall apart in fragrant slabs to be corded by the roadside. There is an allegory for historians in the diverse functions of the saw, wedge, and axe. A saw works only across the years, which it must deal with one by one, in sequence. From each year, the raker teeth pull little chips of fat which accumulate in little piles, called sawdust by woodsmen and archives by historians. Both judge the character of what lies within by the character of the samples thus made visible without. It is not until the transect is completed that the tree falls and the stump yields a collective view of a century. By its fall, the tree attests the unity of the hodgepodge called history. The wedge, on the other hand, works only in radial splits, which a split yields a collective view of all the years at once, or no view at all, depending on the skill in which the plane of the split is chosen. If in doubt, let the section season for a year until a crack develops. Many a hastily driven wedge lies rusting in the woods, embedded in unsplittable cross grain. The axe functions only as an angle diagonal to the years, and this only for the peripheral rings of the recent past. Its special function is to lop limbs, for which both saw and wedge are useless. The three tools are requisite to a good oak and to a good history. These things I ponder as the kettle sings, and the good oak burns to red coals on white ashes. Those ashes come spring. I will return to the orchard at the foot of the sand hill. They will come back to me again, perhaps as red apples, or perhaps as the spirit of enterprise in some fat October squirrel who, for some reasons unknown to himself, is bent on planting acorns. Mm -hmm.